With the new abilities he finds himself wielding, Duwen is pulled into a whole new realm of inter gang disputes, romantic dilemmas, and a major conspiracy behind the death of his father years ago. Thanks to this incredible blessing given to him, he might just find the answers he seeks. Duwen Ha is an average 18 year old high school student, with one exception. He hates video games. You see, Du Wen is what's known as a game shuttle. Thanks to being an easily bullied dude, he's forced to play games all the time on other people's accounts and grind for them. As if that wasn't bad enough, they use it as an excuse to make fun of him. He does not even want to play you hypocrites. While playing on about eight different devices at the same time, Du Wen is spoken to by none other than Aranju, a beautiful and popular girl at school who he has a crush on. As it turns out, she plays a game that Du Wen's grinding as well. After offering to advise her on how best to play it, he's shocked to learn she actually knows his name. Yeah, because that's so hard to know. Unfortunately, in his time distracted by Aaron, Duwin ends up dying in one of his games. Oh well, oh no, wait, he just lost a really important item with that death. And that was the game he was playing for Cho Wu Min. Who's that you ask? Well, this guy. So huge bully, you get the gist of it. He's pissed that Duwin lost him the item. Even though Duwen offers to give him the same item from his own inventory, Cho Wu decides to be, well him. He beats the crap out of Duwen anyways. Good times for him that is. Not so much for our boy Duwen. Cho Wu tells Duwen that he started the game Roast RPG. He wants Duwen to get him the legendary equipment, Fire King's Greatsword, within a week. If he doesn't, Cho Wu's gonna strip him naked and beat his cheeks in front of Aaron. That sounded way too sus. He's gonna beat him up as all. Luckily. Duwen's actually a huge game otaku. Wait, what? Oh, he just hates playing as a game shuttle. He actually loves playing on his own accounts. That is actually understandable. What's more, he's already a max level player in Roast RPG. Oh, whoops, never mind. The level cap's doubled since he last played, so he's actually super behind now. Also, drop rates for items are worse now, because the game studio is thirsty as, you know, I mean, they're smart businessmen. So they've introduced a new feature that's pretty much the only way to get decent drop rates, microtransactions. And so 144 hours, or 6 days straight, pass with Duwen getting nothing but the crappiest drops possible from the hardest bosses he can beat. Guess he's getting his cheeks beaten after all then? No, not like that. Luckily, a max level player shows up and one-shots the boss he was fighting at the last moment. After making a request, Duwen's accepted into this player's party, and ends up piggybacking on their success. Convenient. Within just minutes after that, Duwen not only gets the Fire King's greatsword Chou Wu wants, but also the Fire God's greatsword. That thing's way more OP. Being an honorable guy, Duwen hands it over to his partner. After all, this is all thanks to them. With his task finally accomplished, Duwen logs out of the game to get some sleep, and then dies from exhaustion and malnourishment. Wait, he what? Next thing he knows, Duwen's in pitch black darkness with a game-like system pop up in front of him. After assigning him the class Powerless Game Shuttle, Rude, the system assigns him a quest and responds him in the location decided by the administrator. Suddenly, Duwen's reliving the events of the day he spoke to Aaron Ju. As he looks at what's clearly a character status screen for himself, he receives a pop-up. His class's characteristic effect has been activated. All XP that he's ever gained in any and every game will now be applied to him as the player, as the system starts calculating how much that is, good old Chol Wu drops by for the beating he gave Duwen before. Hurry the heck up, system. Unlike last time, though, Aaron comes back to the classroom while Duwen's being beaten and steps in to defend him. Unlike himself, Duwen can't stand seeing someone else being hurt. As Minwo raises his hand to Aaron, he steps in and punches the bully in the palm. Yeah, he caught it, your screwed man. Oop, never mind. System finally finished up its system stuff. In a single moment, Duwen's class goes up to superior game shuttle. He gains an attack skill straight out of a game and he demolishes Minwu. As he sits in shock at what he just did, Duwen receives a message in the form of the system pop up. It's from the administrator, but Duwen instantly realizes who this is thanks to their weird speech. It's the same person who helped him in Roast RPG. Next, he receives a pop up saying he's defeated the monster Cho Wu Min. With the XP from that, He's reached the max level. He's now a sealed game shuttle and starts getting dozens of pop-ups telling him each of his stats have been maxed out. He can now use all the skills in all the games he's ever played and they're gone. Yes, a sealed game shuttle is just what it sounds like. Since he's now too overpowered, 
The system sealed all his stats down to one point. Just great. You got Golden Key that's class as a legendary item, so that's cool though. As if that wasn't bad enough, he ends up running into Shin Jamin later. Who's that you ask? Well, this guy's a massive delinquent. Probably not a great guy. You get it. Unfortunately, Jamin was actually outside the classroom and saw what happened between Duwon and Cholwu. After that, he's convinced Duwon is some secretly powerful guy or something. Wanting to get him as an ally, he invites Duwon to a drinking party that night. Duwon, being the only protagonist around with any common sense, turns him down. Good on him. Wait, no. Never mind. Turns out this is a quest. If he doesn't go, Duwon has to suffer the worst pain in his life in a very sensitive area for a full hour. Needless to say, he ends up accepting. That night, Duwin ends up entranced by the beauty of the girls Jamin's with and sits with them in a karaoke bar. Just when he's starting to think Jamin might not actually be that bad, he shows his true colors. Turns out he's bullying a wallet shovel to pay for all their stuff. Yu Jihan, a kid from their school who Jamin regularly bullies. Unable to watch how badly Jamin keeps humiliating him, Duwin goes to the bathroom. It's not like he can do anything about it with all his stats sealed, right? But he can't shake the feeling that Jihan's situation is the exact same as his, with Cholwu. He can't just let him suffer. Heading back into the karaoke room, Duwin decides to do the only thing he can. Fake it, till he makes it. As he prepares to stand up to Jamin, the delinquent's friend shows up. A high schooler. Totally. Yeah. I believe that. This dude looks like a damn mafia boss. Terrified, Duwin backs off and says he just wanted the mic. It's his turn to do the karaoke after all. As he gets on stage, a pop-up for a new quest appears. One who judges injustice. He must smack Jamin's head with the mic. Oh man, he's screwed now. The quest displays a 30-minute time limit before Duwen will be hit with the same penalty as before. Despite the threat of this though, he can't bring himself to do something so dangerous. After they all sit down, Yuk Manchun, Jamin's friend, questions how someone like Duwen could have beaten Cholwu. Jamin assures him that it's true though, and makes his offer to Duwen. The real reason he invited him here. He wants Duwin to join their gang and use his power to make them the strongest. That way he'll never be bullied again. Great sales pitch. Duwin's about to fall for it, but some whispered words from Jihan give him pause. Can he really side with the exact same kind of people who've made his life hell for so long? At least he'll have a better life, right? Determined to withstand the pain of his penalty, Duwin goes to the bathroom alone. As he prepares for what's coming though, he realizes he can't go through with this. When Jamin comes into the bathroom after him, Duwin smashes his head with the mic so hard he collapses. You go, boy. With Jamin unconscious, Duwin decides to try and free Jahan. He grabs Jamin's phone and starts sending troll messages to Yuk. With this, he'll be lured outside and Jihan can escape easily. Wait, what's that shadow over him? Bam, yeah, Yuk. Saw right through him. He's gonna beat the crap out of him now. Smacks our boy silly. No, really. I think some of his brains got knocked out his ears. With Duwin knocked down, Yuk goes to check on Jamin. On the ground, Duwin begs for a way to fight back. Just then, his skill window appears with a locked shape on it. Finally, he has something to use his golden key on. As Yuk checks on Jamin, he hears Duwin standing back up. With the blue energy surrounding him, the shell is prepared for round two. Duwin may have been a loser, but he'll never be beaten by a bully again. His plan flops. Yeah, that seems to happen often. Unlucky. The skill that was unlocked is Falcon Drop. A super powerful dropkick that'll knock anyone out. Just one problem. It costs 120 mana and Duwin only has 100. Great. After Manchun beats the crap out of him, again, Duwin starts thinking. The golden key gave him the skill, but he got a copper key from beating Jamin as well. Maybe that will increase his mana. Duwin desperately tries to go back to the bathroom with a key drop, but, well... Manchun's still here. After getting beaten to a pulp, Duwen pulls a sneaky on Manchun and tricks him into letting him go. Guess he's as stupid as he looks. After reaching the key's location, Duwen manages to grab it and raise his mana by 100 points just in the nick of time. Manchun's ran on top of him when Duwen finally becomes able to use Falcon Drop. In one smooth motion, he pushes off the thug's knee to jump up and drop onto Manchun with a kick hard enough to shake the floor. With this victory, he receives another key. A silver one. No time to celebrate, though. Jimin's here. Also Manchun's older brother who works here. Also a few dozen other guys are friends with Pia. Duwin screwed. It was a cool story while it lasted. With no plan to speak of and his mana exhausted. Things ain't looking too great for our boy. 
At least, not until the bar's manager barges in. As it turns out, someone called the police to report underage drinking happening here. If they don't want to get arrested, everyone has to leave now. That is convenient. Oh well, never mind. There's the catch. Dewin's so exhausted from everything that's happened that he collapses. When he opens his eyes next, he's in the women's bathroom with one of the girls from Jamin's group. What the hell is going on here? Oh, she saved him. Cool. Turns out she saw his fight with Man Chun and was pretty impressed with the falcon drop. She was the one who called the cops. Cool. She tells Duwin that he owes her a wish and he should remember that. Definitely want to come back to bit him in the behind. Three days later, Duwin wakes at his apartment from a long sleep. I'd be exhausted too after a day like that. Right after dying and coming back to life, a week in the past no less, his first action is to lob onto Roast RPG and find the player who's now the administrator of his system. Unfortunately, that player's ID has been deleted. He really doesn't want to talk to Duwin right now. With that out of the window, Duwin decides to collect his thoughts on everything he knows about this system. Bullies are classed as the monsters of this game. By beating them, he gets keys as a reward. Bronze keys unlock some of his sealed stats. Silver keys unlock passive skills. Gold keys unlock special moves or active skills. Right as he's finishing up his thoughts, the doorbell rings. Thinking his takeout food is here. Duwin starts rushing to the door when a pop-up comes up. Quest. The boy becomes a man. At his door stands the girl who saved him the other day. The first thing she does is walk in and tell Duwin to take it off. Oh cool, she just wants, wait, what? Oh, another misunderstanding. She just meant it's way too hot in his apartment, that's all. What you think she meant? After entering the apartment, she instantly heads to Duwin's wardrobe and craps on his fashion sense. Did his mom pick all his clothes for him? Um, yeah, she kinda did. She tells him he's gonna need a better outfit and takes Duwin clothes shopping. After finding him an appropriate getup, she tells him she needs him to look at least a little cool if he's going to spend the day with her. After all, that's her wish. For the rest of the day, Duwin allows the system to guide him on what to do. From going for a meal, to watching a movie, to spending time at cafe, and even going to an arcade. Wait a second. This is a date. Since when does the system get you chicks as well? Sorry, lost my cool there. Definitely not jealous of this guy. Over the course of their day, Duwin learns the girl's name is Sion. At the arcade. They even run into a super buff guy who tries to bully him for talking to her. Luckily, she steps in and tells him that Duwin is her boyfriend. Huh. Okay, so that happened. I guess they're official now. As the day comes to a close, Sion leads Duwan to their final destination for the day. A sauna. Oh boy. Things are about to get steamy. Get it? Alright. I'll shut up now. Duwan starts panicking since he's an Ultra Turbo Pro Max Virgi um. Pure young man. Yeah, that's what he is. Luckily, or perhaps not so much, it turns out they're not here for anything inappropriate at all. Sion's actually brought him to see a meeting the Guanak Hu Region's Bully Organization. That's a thing. That sounds ridiculous. What the hell? Oh, and they're announcing a bounty on Duan's head for beating Chol Wu and Man Chun. No biggie. There's also 497 of them, so it'll be pretty hard for Duan to avoid them. No biggie. I'm not in denial. You're in denial. Right as the announcement's made, Duan's pop-up changes to the final stage of his boy becomes a man quest. As it turns out, Sion has brought Duan here for a specific reason. While the Guanaku bullies have initially decided to make him a target, she puts forward the suggestion to make him a leader candidate. Someone who becomes the boss of their own group, area, or squad. Basically, a higher-ranked bully. She votes to make Duan the leader of Boromedong area. Since he's already proven his strength by beating the bullies he did, it shouldn't be an issue. Yeah, can't argue with that. They're all cool with it. Well, except Duwen, he really doesn't want to ally with a bunch of bullies. But on the other hand, his only alternative is to fight almost 500 of them. Yeah, alright, maybe it's not a bad idea. Sion reveals to Duwen that she's only doing this, because she prefer him over the other candidate for the position. Who's that you ask? This guy. Well, ain't that just dandy. Since they're both candidates for the leader of Bera Maidan. The bullies decide there's just one way to settle things. A fight. Yeah, not a lot of brains but plenty of brawn around here. Duan decides to stand his ground and who's flying at Kang with a falcon drop. Unfortunately, it fails. Yeah, Kang's got some crazy high defenses. With his mana too low to attack again, Duan is left defenseless as Kang catches him in a headlock. As the man chokes him out, Duan remembers why he seems familiar. This is the same guy who was a fat, ugly bully back in middle school. Even as far back as then, 
he made Duman's life miserable and humiliated him at every turn. And now, even after all this time, even after gaining this incredible system, he has to put up with that again. Not a chance in hell. Standing back up, Duman calls out to Kang. From this point on, he's going to destroy him. After throwing his jacket to the ground, Duman rushes at Kang. With a plan in mind, the passive skill he got from the Silver Key before should help him win this. Not only does it allow him to inflict a critical hit, it ignores all of the target's defenses. With this move, he'll beat Kang. Yeah, that doesn't go so well. Turns out the skill has a 1% chance of activating. Our genius Duan figured if he just gets 100 hits and then one of them will have to be the crit. Clearly someone didn't pay attention in math class. That's not how probability works, bro. Instead of landing a crit, he just ends up humiliating himself with a display of incredibly weak punches. Tired and annoyed, Kang grabs him by the neck and slams him into the ground. As Duan starts yelling in rage about his actions in middle school, Kang proceeds to pulverize him. Though it seems like his will to fight has completely left him. Duan stands one more time after the latest beating. Everyone present watches in shock at his courage. Yeah, about that, truth is he's staring at the emergency exit. Our boy's trying to pull the runner. While distracting Kang with some half-cooked stories of them being friends back in the day, Duan makes his move. And fails. Kind of. He trips on his own jacket that he dropped earlier. However, this causes his palm to hit Kang's chest as he's falling. And what do you know? The critical hit finally activates. Kang sent flying into the elevator doors with a bang and drops limply to the ground. The other bullies are amazed and start theorizing about the skill they just saw do in use. Blind luck, boys. Blind is a bat in purgatory luck. Oh, and look at that. Kang's back up. And more furious than ever. Fun. Wait, why is Duan smiling? I was being sarcastic. This is not going to be fun. Oh, damn it. He's riding the high of the crit finally activating. He feels damn near invincible right now. Use your brain, Duan. Oh, never mind. There he goes. Luckily, Duan actually does use his brain this time. While finting another chest shot, he goes up and punches Kang's nose sideways instead. The universal weakness of all beings. After that, he grabs Kang's nostrils from behind and starts pulling them up like a nose hook. With no other option except losing his nose, Kang forfeits, leaving down the winner of their battle. The new bully representative of Bera Maidong is Ha Duan. As Duan's celebrating, a machine behind him that was damaged in the fight comes into contact with a puddle of water. You know what that means. Boom. The whole bully council is quick to clear out of the building in a violent stampede. That place is on fire, yo. No? Yeah, okay. I'll shut up. On the street outside, Duman learns that Sion is still up there. Being an utterly hopeless sim, I mean gentleman, Duman rushes back to save her. Despite barely knowing her, he can't help but care about her. When he arrives back to the floor they were at, he barges through the door and calls out that he's there to save her. Wait, where's the fire? Ah. Turns out the meeting organizer put it out with a fire extinguisher. It wasn't actually that big of one at all. Well then, this is awkward. Later. Duman drops Sion off at her home on the way back to his own. Though he's clearly not sure what to do or say. Sion is. Turning to him with a smile. She thanks him for coming to save her and heads inside. After that, Duan opens the system pop-up to receive his rewards for the Becoming a Man quest. When he does, he sees something shocking. The first day of 12th grade has arrived. Before anyone else, Duan arrives at school to set up all of his game shovel equipment. When he does, though... He's surprised to find someone's actually already in class. To his shock and fear, it's someone Sion warned him about. Someone she told him to always avoid. The most dangerous bully in Wanak, Han Young Sun, is a student in his school. Luckily, Young Sun ends up not fighting Duan. Amused by something he said, Young Sun tells him he's fine with them being allies. As per that alliance, he will make sure no one from Silindong, his area, will mess with Duan anymore. Thank you, good sir. Very cool. Weirdly enough, as the first day of school goes on, Duan is surprised to find that nobody's tried to make him play games yet. Not only that, the usual bullying that happens isn't seen either. Everything's abnormally peaceful. Young Sun must have kept his promise to keep the Silindong folks in check. When he heads to the bathroom during break, he even runs into Shin Jaemin. Unlike his expectations though, the guy treats Duan like some sort of superior. I mean, Duan did clap his cheeks pretty hard. Well, not like, you know what I meant. Later in class, he even gets a gift from Arun. Turns out she's thankful for his help with Cholwu before and she wanted to get him something to help since he got hurt back then. So she got him a live octopus and she wants him to eat it. 
What the actual hell woman? I don't care if it helps with stamina. You better not eat that thing, Doo-One. Before he can, a strange, new guy walks up to Doo-One and demands that he play games for him. Oh thank god. I mean, oh no. Yeah, that's the one. Furious at someone interrupting his talk with Arin. Doo-Wan walks up to the guy's seat and slams his phone onto his desk. With a smug look on his face, he tells the guy to play his own games if he doesn't want to die. Alright, might be getting a bit too cocky now, buddy. Oh, and what do you know? I'm right. Doo-Wan doesn't realize it, but this guy is so sung -woo. The Bon Xian Dong associate of the Wanak District Bully Council. sung -woo. surprisingly enough, actually seems to be a pretty calm guy. He admits that he didn't mean to be rude, he just heard that Doo-Wan enjoys playing games. And he does it for others. With that misunderstanding cleared up, they turn away from each other. Unfortunately for Duwen, Arin was taken out of the classroom by a friend of hers before she could see him stand up for himself. That was like his whole reason for doing this, come on man. But wait, it's lunchtime. So maybe if he hurries, Duwen can make his way to Arin and eat with her. That would be incredible. Unfortunately for him, he's stopped by someone grabbing his wrist. Turning around, he's surprised to see Jihan, but wallet shovel from the whole mess with Jaemin. He's trying to warn Doo-Wan about Sung Woo. When Doo-Wan asks why he's a problem since he seemed pretty reasonable, Jihan admits that's true. Sung Woo is actually a really calm person. He doesn't bully people for no reason. He doesn't even get mad at anyone who provokes him. But there's one thing. One offense that flips a total switch within him. When someone cuts in line in front of him. Wait, is that it? Of all the things, that's what drives him to violence. Well, can't say. I don't get it though. Down in the cafeteria, Sung Woo's actually brutalizing a senior student with his ridiculous speed for that exact offense. He really hates line cutters. With Jihan's warning and the incident in the cafeteria fresh in his mind, Doo-Wan's actually pretty happy. As long as he doesn't cut in line ahead of Sung Woo, he'll never have to worry about angering him at all. That's great. Now if only the system felt the same way. Yup, right as Doo-Wan's heading home for the day, a quest pop-up appears, full sprint. Within the next 10 minutes, he has to run up to Sung Woo and cut ahead of him. If he doesn't, he'll face the promised penalty of penal pain. Try saying that five times fast. After rushing across campus to find Sung Woo, Doo-Wan comes across a nerd lane beaten in an alley. After accidentally cutting ahead of Sung Woo due to being in a rush for class, he was beaten into the ground by the bully. Seeing him crying, Doo-Wan offers a napkin to wipe his tears. With just two minutes remaining for his quest, he tells the guy that he reminds him of himself. For his sake and his own, he'll get revenge on Sung Woo. With a keychain holding several system keys, Doo-Wan steps out of the alley, ready to puke his guts out. What? Being a protagonist is nerve-wracking stuff, man. Six days ago, when Doo-Wan received the rewards for the chain quest with si Yun, he got four bronze keys and a single gold one. When he did, he decided it'd be smarter to save the keys for a time of need. Since he can choose which stat to boost with them, he can wait to see what fighting style his next enemy would have and boost himself accordingly. And so, Back in the present day, Doo-Wan does exactly that. Having analyzed Sung Woo's fighting style, he can easily confirm that his opponent is a fully speed-based fighter. After using his gold key, he receives a new attack with a 20 mana cost, Blind Spot Strike. With this, he can fire off several attacks without worrying about running out of mana. Just to be safe though, he uses a bronze key to boost his mana up to 300. Then, he puts the rest of the bronze keys all into a single stat. With his preparations made, he heads out after Sung Woo. There's only two minutes left on his quest clock, after all. Over at the station, Sung Woo is about to attack a girl who ran past him to catch her bus. Come on, man, that's not cool at all. Right before he can grab her, Doom arrives on the scene and grabs him by his hoodie. After pulling him back, he steps past Sung Woo and completes the first stage of his current quest. With this, the next stage is activated, defeat the monster So Sung Woo. All right, that's gonna be considerably harder, Mr. System, sir. Before Sung Woo can properly react, Doo-Wan shoots off a blind spot strike to do some damage. Unfortunately, while it definitely hurt him, it doesn't slow Sung Woo down in the slightest. When he tries to run a little further, Sung Woo instantly catches him and rips off his backpack. Desperate, Doo-Wan fires of a triple blind spot strike to do a bunch of damage at once. While each strike isn't very hard hitting due to its low mana cost, they're pretty damaging when comboed like that. Unlucky for Doo-Wan though, this just makes Sung Woo get serious. Like really serious. Like Rockley serious. He drops his backpack to the floor with a crashing bam sound and suddenly appears in front of Doo-Wan faster than he can even see. Rockley who? Wait no. I take it back. That's disrespectful to the goat. He is really fast though. 
Duwen can't land a single hit on him anymore with this new speed. Sun Wu just keeps blitzing him with super fast attacks he can't do anything about. Backed into a corner, Duwen does what he does best, gaming. By looking at the fight as a video game battle, he's able to analyze the best way to fight back in his situation. By using his blind spot strikes as a feint, he lands a staggering back fist straight to Sun Wu's face. Though that was just a normal punch, it did considerable damage. Duwen knew right from the start, he couldn't beat Sun Wu in a straight up battle of speed. So using his bronze keys, he boosted his attack power as much as possible instead. Now, with even a single hit, he can hurt Sun Wu. As long as the system makes things look like a game, no one can beat Ha Duwen. As the battle goes on, Duwen attempts to predict Sun Wu's attacks as though it were a game. Unfortunately, Sun Wu makes an unexpected move when he uses his legs to attack instead of his fists. The kick lands straight on Duwen's forehead and knocks him to the ground. After getting up, he once again attempts to feint Sun Wu with blind spot strikes and catch him off guard. Sun Wu's already seen through that trick though so he's not about to fall for it again. One of them actually knows how to fight Ha. Too bad it's the bad guy. After catching Duwen's arm, he heel kicks him in the chin and drops him to the ground. As Sun Wu walks towards him, Duwen suddenly has a realization. He has legs. Alright Mr. Quirkless, how did you not realize that sooner? He's been using blind spot strike with his fingers this whole time, but the move doesn't specify which body part needs to be used. With this knowledge, Duwen uses a leg sweep infused with his skill to trip Sun Wu up. With that done, he pulls out his secret trump card. Octopus Inc. Huh, that was unexpected. Turns out he had the octopus, Aaron gifted him this whole time and hid it in Sun Wu's hoodie when their fight started. After Sun Wu dropped him to the ground, he started revealing his sad past. Horrible dad. Sad upbringing, psychotic developed behavior, yada yada yada. You get the idea. Gara, but with a much more worthless dad basically. While he's doing that, the octopus crawls out of the hoodie and latches onto his head. When Sun Wu tries to force it off his head, it releases a ton of ink that runs into his eyes and blinds him. Duwen prepares to take advantage and finally finish this. With a double-handed axe blow to his head, Duwen knocks Sun Wu downwards before smashing up with a blind spot strike headbutt to his chin. The battle is over. And this victory is dedicated to Aaron. After beating Sun Wu, Duwen is rewarded with another key bundle holding one gold and two bronze keys. With how low his HP is after the fight, he's forced to use one of the bronze ones to raise his HP stat. Next, he uses the golden key to unlock another random active skill. To his delight, it turns out to be multi-hit strike, the move he used to defeat Chou Wu before his power was sealed away. While this is a powerful move, it costs 200 mana points to activate. With this in mind, Duwen puts his remaining bronze key into mana and raises his MP to 400. With all that done, Duwen decides to keep Aran's octopus as a gif and name it Squishy. Yeah, he's not very creative, is he? Not very aware of his surroundings either, actually. Pretty sure that's Squishy in that cat's mouth. And so, the life of Duwen's valued comrade comes to an end. Gone but never forgotten. Rest in peace, Squishy. Back at his apartment, Duwen receives a call from his mom reminding him to go visit his father's grave on his death anniversary next week. She can't make it due to her business trips, so he'll have to go on his own this year. The next day at school, Jihan tells Duwen about how Sun Wu is absent from class today and that's very unlike him. While fading ignorance, Duwen wonders if him defeating Sun Wu means he can finally now live with some level of peace in his life. Oh, you silly little boy. You're a main character. You're never getting that. True to that sentiment. A large group of thugs breaks into the school and comes straight to Duwen's class. Their leader tells him he has to come to Bong Shin Dong with them. Thanks to the danger sense developed from years of being the victim of bullies, Duwen can tell that would not end well for him. When he refuses to go along, the man asks him a question. Can he really take on all ten of them on his own? Right then, another party enters the scene. Han Young's son enters and asks the man what he's doing. When one of the lesser thugs tries to talk down to him, Han barely even moves to perform a simple swipe of his leg. That swipe, however, it's enough to totally crush the thug's leg and leave him on the floor. With his show of dominance completed, Ham Young Sun tells them they can't have Duwen and drops one of the coldest lines in all of Manwa. Can they really take him on with just ten of them? I think I just nutted. With that absolute bar of a line dropped, Young Sun goes on to systemically dismantle every single one of the thugs present with minimal effort. He is him. After wiping the floor with all the scrubs, he leaves their leader to clean up the mess. Before walking out of the class, he tells Duwen to join him at the snack bar. There, he suddenly asks Duwen what his reason is. 
The sudden question causes our resident shovel to smirt juice out his nose in shock. Ung Sun clarifies his question, and asks why Do Wen became a bully representative, and also fights other ones at the same time. Deciding to act cool, Do Wen turns to him and declares that he's a bully hunter. Uh, did he forget he's literally talking to a bully? Luckily for him, and also kinda weirdly, Ung Sun just breaks down laughing and wishes Do Wen good luck with his goal. That had to be foreshadowing of some sort. I'm calling it now. Following this, several days pass with Duwen worried about being attacked by the Bongshandong folks again. Thankfully, they don't show up. Convenient. With this new period of peace in his life, Duwen heads to a PC cafe to play games. Not only does he get to have fun there in peace, Aaron even turns out to be owner's daughter. She works here sometimes to help out and is serving Duwen. Oh man, living the life ain't he. While she heads off to get him some more stuff, Duwen sees a group of shady looking guys acting weird around a PC that a kid was playing on. Who's gone to the bathroom right now? I'm sure they're not doing anything immoral, right? Ah, turns out they stole all the kids' hard-earned items. When Duwen reveals he knows who must be responsible for this, the kid begs him to help him get his stuff back. Now normally he'd stay out of this, but for one thing, the system suddenly gives him a quest to beat the thieves, all four of them. Plus, Aurin is watching, so this could decide how she sees him going forward. And if that wasn't enough, this is a hidden quest, which means there's also a hidden reward. When Duwen sees what the reward is, he doesn't even have to think for a second. He instantly rushes after the thieves. Out in an alleyway, the four thieves are discussing their latest loot when one of them is suddenly dropped to the ground. Duwen has arrived, and he plans to take all of these guys out. After all, the hidden reward for this quest is none other than a date with Ju Aran. With his heart pounding and his resolve burning to get the date with Aran, Duwen is more confident than ever. Standing before the thieves, he openly declares they got no chance of escape, and that the guy he hit gets back up. That blind spot strike didn't even knock him out. Hoops. Suddenly nervous again, Duwen does a complete 180 and runs his scrawny behind out of that alley. With the thieves chasing after him, he runs into another alley, a little further up the street. Unfortunately, one of the thieves points out that alley's a dead end so he's stuck now. To their surprise, when they enter the alley, there's nobody to be found. Not to the left, right, ahead, not even oh. There he is. Duwen sitting up on a staircase railing all Spider-Man style. Or is that a taxi style? Tough call. Anyways, he jumps down from above and knocks the crap out of one of the thieves with a falcon kick. After seeing how easily their friend was just taken out, the other thieves are finally getting nervous about their situation. When Duwen introduces himself as the bully rep of Baramadon though, they just get annoyed and think he's mocking them. After all, what the hell even is a bully council? Finally, someone said it. Luckily for Duwen. These thieves are as stupid and rash as they are dishonest. The second one rushes right at him, with no skill, and gets a blind spot strike right to the throat. Ouch! While he recovers, the remaining two try to flank Duwen from both sides, and they each get a blind spot strike to the gut. Man, Duwen is really killing it today. Then, as the three thieves try to come up with a plan, Duwen backs them into the alley's corner. Now, with nowhere for them to escape, he activates his newest ability. Multi-Strike Destruction. The last two thieves are knocked out with no mercy. The only one remaining conscious is the one whose throat he struck earlier, as he begs for mercy. Duwen actually feels kinda bad for him. Maybe he should spare fists. Nope. Date with Aran is on the line. Sorry, Mr. Thief. After he knocks out the final thief, Duwen receives a silver key from the system. Later, he has all the thieves return to the PC cafe and give back the items they stole. As they apologize for their actions down on their knees, Duwen glows in the happiness of his achievement. After the thieves leave, Arun tells him she'll treat him to dinner, as thanks for all his help. The date is finally happening. Hell yes! As Arun prepares for their date, Duwen thinks back on the first time they met. Back in elementary school, there were a pair of girls who often bullied another girl in his class. One day, Duwen decided he couldn't tolerate such a thing. He stood up to the bullies for that girl and did his best to defend her. Unfortunately, the bully's leader back then was a really dangerous girl. With a single strike to the chest, she dropped Duwen. Yeah, that was Aaron. What? You thought it was the bully girl? Nah. She changed after they separated in middle school though. She's like a totally different and much nicer person now. Before Aaron gets back from changing her clothes, Duwen decides to use his latest silver key. From this, he receives the passive skill, Weapon Mastery. When fighting opponent with a weapon, his own skill with one will slightly be raised. That's weirdly specific. Before he can think on it any further, 
Aaron returns, in a form-fitting white dress, Duwen might actually lose his life today, and not even from a fight. At Aaron's decision, the two head to a tteokbokki slash noodle restaurant. Aaron mentions that it's got some slightly unusual dishes, so we should be prepared. Slightly unusual? Won in this stuff is right out of a horror movie, mint chocolate noodles. But of course, simp that he is, Duwen gulps it all down with nothing but praise for Oren's favorite dish. Later, they head to a game lounge to play stuff like Jenga, a lie detector machine and other stuff. Good times. When they finally step outside, they see a hammernail game stall nearby. Deciding to take a shot at the stuffed prizes, they each buy a turn. After Oren loses, Duwen steps up to show his skills. As he prepares to knock this out of the park and impress his crush, a system pop-up suddenly appears. Quest. Hammer down. Slams you Aaron's head with full power within the next five minutes. What the hell? As the timer on the quest ticks down, Duwen can't bring himself to do what he must. He slams down the hammer on the stall table and turns to, oh? Well, talk about some good luck. There's another stall set up nearby with a toy hammer game. That's perfect. After several tries, Duwen finally manages to beat Aaron at the 1v1 game and absolutely smashes the toy hammer into her skull. With this, the quest is completed with merely seconds to spare. Later, as the two are walking towards home, Duwen is worried that Aaron's mad at him. When he tries to ask her though, the girl just bursts out laughing. It's been a while since she lost a game, especially in such a funny way. She tells Duwen that she enjoyed their time together and she'd love to play games with him again next time. With that said, she parts ways with Duwen and heads back to her dad's PC cafe. Right as she's leaving, Duwen suddenly feels a massive weight on his shoulder. A huge thug with a scarred face is standing by him with a foam in hand. As it turns out, this is a friend of the thieves he beat up earlier. What a bunch of babies. Really went crying to daddy, didn't they? Luckily, the thug suddenly tells Duwen he's lost interest in avenging his friends, right as Duwen starts thanking him. He says something disgusting. He's planning on heading after Orin and playing with her instead. Gross. Come on, Duwen, mess this sucker up. Enraged by his words, Duwen grabs the man's shoulder and tells him to follow him with a furious look on his face. With this, the sudden quest to defeat Sun Minju activates. Over an alley, Duwen can be seen hitting Minju repeatedly, desperately trying to get a critical hit. After how recklessly he used his active skills against the thieves, he has no mana left. And without going to sleep, he can't even recover any of it. Annoyed, Minju knocks Duwen back and brings out a pair of brass knuckles. With these weapons, He'll destroy Duwen. Weapons, you say? Passive skill time, baby. With weapon mastery boosting his power, Duwen shoots forward and smacks the smug right out of his opponent. On his knees, Minju demands to know where he suddenly got a metal bat from. Except, once he looks closer, he realizes there is no bat. The weapon in Duwen's hands is none other than the half-destroyed toy hammer from his date. Thanks to his skill, Duwen's able to match Minju quite well. At least, until he decides to be a sore loser and tackle Duwen. Luckily, our boy is quick on his feet. Using the handle of the hammer, he strikes down at Minju and goes on to smash it directly into his head. With this he'll definitely. Oh, well that's unfortunate. The hammer finally broke completely. He's got no weapon now. Guess that's what you get for bringing a toy to a weapon fight. With Duwen's weapon gone, he proceeds to get body by Minju in a terribly painful display of power from the brass knuckle wielding thug. As he makes disgusting remarks about Oren and spouts nonsense about how living as a villain is best, Duwen's finally had enough. Even in his battered state, he stands and faces Minju with a new weapon, his own belt. With his skill activated, Duwen uses the belt to whip Minju like a bowl of cream in a heat bakery. Even when the bigger thug grabs the belt and attempts to stop him, Duwen just traps him and flips the whole sucker over his shoulder. With that final slam, the battle is won. After checking up on Aaron and her dad from a distance, Duwen heads back home to rest and recover. There, he wonders about Min Yu's words. He doesn't really have an argument against a villainous life being an easier one. He wonders what his dad would say if he was still around. Deciding to leave that issue for later, Duwen brings out his rewards from the day. Five whole bronze keys. With fights breaking out in such sudden scenarios, he can't afford to delay boosting himself anymore. Since he's already put some keys into his attack, he goes ahead and puts three keys in agility and two in defense. After that, he takes a look at his final reward, a dungeon map. As it turns out, the dungeon map is just an apartment sales booklet. The apartment building's still under construction and the dungeon is the construction site. 
It opens in five days, requires a minimum two-man party, and has a penalty if it isn't completed, so male pressure then. Desperate to get another party member, but constantly fails. Yang Sun straight out refuses. Jihan has already been bullied so much that he feel bad bringing him to a dangerous place, and actually that's it. Duan doesn't know a lot of people, does he? After the day's classes end, he heads out and finds Sion waiting for him outside school. She wants to have him finally meet the Boromedong bullies who he's a representative for. Oh boy, this'll be fun. Never mind, there's only two other people and one of them's Kang Stihun. This is gonna suck. After Sion scares Duan and Kang into playing nice, the final member of their group is introduced. Shin Sihi. A cool middle-aged man who, wait what? This guy's a high school student? Well okay then, I guess. As the meeting goes on, Duan learns that the Boromedong bully was cut down significantly due to an incident with a previous representative. He doesn't learn the details though, as Sion soon switches topics to him. He hasn't gotten into any trouble lately, has he? Like messing with other bullies, antagonizing other groups, fighting random thugs. None of that, right? Definitely not. Either way, the Boromedong group is weak at present so Sion's orders are for them to lay low. Four days later, a sinister plot is seen to be brewing at the dungeon site. The Bongshindong gang are up to no good. With no one else to turn to, Duan ends up enlisting Kang Sihun's help for the dungeon. If anyone can help him clear it, he'll be him with his monstrous defense and power. Just one catch though, he has to hand over the representative position to Kang. In exchange for his help, could be worse I guess. Onwards they go. At the site, Kang displays a level of power and toughness that Duan's only ever gotten to see in their own battle. Seeing him now, easily destroying all the low-level Bongshindong thugs at the site without even flinching. Duwen can only be grateful they're on the same side. If it weren't for his critical hit passive, there's no way he would have ever beat Kang. Duwen's fine with letting Kang do all the work at first, but then a system pop-up appears. Dungeon Novice. For defeating five normal monsters, he'll receive a gold key. Duwen doesn't really want to fight by gold key. Can't let that go to waste, can he? Wielding a toy lightsaber, I think that's what it is at least. We'll just call it his weapon for now. Wielding his weapon with the mastery passive skill, Duwen jumps into the fight as well. A bar ride of hits on one guy, a block, trip and stab on another, and he easily takes out his first two opponents. A little ways away, Kang is impressed with Duwen's improvement since their own fight. He's happy to see the kid has some skill after all. While he takes down a bunch more thugs, Duwen manages to beat another two as well. He only needs to beat one more enemy for the gold key. Unfortunately, there's only one left and he's in Kang's grasp. He tries to get Kang to let him take the guy, but yeah, that's not happening. Luckily, his focus was off just long enough for the thug to pull out a knife and stab Kang. Well, try to stab him that is. Duwen just throws his weapon like a javelin and knocks the thug out cold, saving Kang in the process. Kang goes chundiri pretty much instantly at being saved and says he's heading further up the construction site. After all, his goal is Ji-Bai Chang the Bongshindong deputy. On their way upstairs, they're met by the man who led the raid on Duan's school recently. He tries to stop them, but Duan hits him with a blind spot strike to allow Kang to go on. In a dungeon like this, the deputy is probably the boss. Kang can deal with that just fine. Duan's happy to stay here and deal with this lower level thug. Terrible choice as it turns out. This guy, Cho Il-suk, is an elite monster according to the system. And he's got a counter for pretty much every single thing Duan tries. This would normally send Duman running, but he knows just how massive the rewards from dungeon clears are. He will win this battle. Well, he's got the spirit at least. As the fight between Ilsuk and Duman progresses, he's happy to find his new battle strategy is working quite well. Instead of using it as a primary attack, he's using blind spot strikes to interrupt his enemy's own attacks. When that happens, an even bigger opening is created, which he can strike it with full power. How about that? He really is a true gamer. Even when Il-Suk manages to get some hits in, Duan finds it's quite easy to block them thanks to the stats he raised recently. Just as things are looking up for Duan, Il-Suk starts talking. Oh boy, here comes the villain speech. Il-Suk tells Duan that he actually researched him recently. His father, Hajino, devoted his life to an organization meant to guide bullies and delinquents back onto the proper path. Before he can say anything further, Duan angrily tells him to keep his dad out of this. Upstairs, a fairly even battle between Kang and Bag Chang is underway as well. While fighting, Kang mentions that all of Bae Chang's men are already finished. The only one left is currently being dealt with by his rep, so this'll all be over soon. 
Hearing this, Bei Chang reveals some important information. Ilsa isn't just any underling, he's the toughest fighter they got. No matter what he's hit with or how hard, he always stands back up. It's as though the man has infinite stamina. Down below, this is proven to be true. Despite Duman's attacks doing severe damage, Ilsa refuses to do anything, but keep coming at him. From blind spot strikes to a falcon drop, he's hit Ilsuk with everything but the man won't stay down even in his bloodied state. With just barely enough MP left for it, Duman steps forward and tries to use multi-strike destruction. Unfortunately, his exhausted state causes the skill activation to be cancelled. What is that, reverse plot armor? Thanks to this exhausted state, Ilsuk is able to start hitting back and knocks Duan to the ground. Standing over him, he starts talking smack about how disappointed Duan's father would be that his own son became a member of the Bully Council. Emotional damage. Constantly talking about this, Ilsuk waits for Duan to get back on his feet, and then hits him right in the face with a punch. And he doesn't so much as move, with an enraged look on his face. Duan grabs Ilsuk's shirt, and warns him again to keep his dad out of this. It's time to bring out the newest active skill he got from the earlier Golden Key. Back when he was just a little kid, Duan often played a video game with his father, though it was a fairly simple one. The final stage was always seen as impossible to beat, thanks to the boss who never stayed down. Right now in the present, he's facing just such an enemy. Using his latest active skill, 90 MP cost, Stun Smash. He grabs Ilsuk and smashes him into the ground with brutal force. With this, the battle should finally be over. Oh, my bad. Ilsuk gets right back up. So much for ending this. Back on his feet, Ilsuk goes on to dodge all of Duan's tired attacks. He fires back with punch after kick, and constantly beats Duan back. While hitting him in the face with repeated punches, he comments that Duan is clearly just as much of a hopeless idiot, whose efforts are worthless. Just like his father, this spurs Duan back into action. Though, there's no force left in his attacks, he can't back down now. He stumbles towards Duan, and hits him with a single punch. And what do you know? His critical hit activates. With this, even Ilsuk is flung back to the edge of the floor, Despite doing clearly high damage, the crit isn't enough to keep him down though. Ilsuk simply gets back up and gut punches Duan. All according to plan. The two were standing right at the top of the site's staircase. Duan grabs Ilsuk by the face and jumps. Taking the unbeatable man with him, he activates Stun Smash and uses its hidden secret. Just like in the video game when he was a kid, the answer is simple. To beat the boss, you just have to grab him and throw him down. With Ilsuk falling from a height, Stun Smash is upgraded and turned into Stun Slam. Like Duan's father once told him, there's no such thing as useless effort. Joe Ilsuk has been defeated, about damn time. After beating Ilsuk, Duan hurries up to the roof where Kang went to fight Baek Chang. Here, he's shocked to find Kang down with Chang about to deliver a finishing blow. Despite his current state, Duan jumps in and strikes Chang away from his comrade. Standing in place, he tells Kang to escape right now. He's the one who dragged him into this whole mess, so he'll stall while he gets out of here. Though his words are heavy, his fists at this point are not. Duan's completely out of mana, and he only has a handful of HP left as well. A battle right now, with the boss monster of the dungeon no less, is a hopeless one. Luckily, Duan is saved by the appearance of a new person. The rep of Bong Shindong, Jung Suk Yang. Despite his graceful looks and intimidating stare, Duan can't help but notice something. This guy is a midget. Well, maybe not that small, but he's pretty small. The heck. Unlike his height though, Jum's power is no laughing matter. With a single kick, he sends Bak Chung into a wall, knocked out and beaten. Bae Chang's been acting without his approval for quite a while, so it's time to rein him in. After messing with Duan a little, he reveals he was brought here by none other than Young Sun. Though he refused to come here with Duan, it seems he remembered the address and decided to help out after all. As those two leave, Duan sighs in relief. The dungeon is finally cleared. He helps Kang walk out of the site, since he's fairly injured. Out on the street, he warns Duan that Yun Sung must have a hidden reason for helping him tonight. As the Boar Madong rep, he has to be careful. This prompts Duan to tell Kang that he's the rep now, since that was their agreement. The position is all Kang's. Kang, however, is just reminded of the not one, but two times Duan saved him tonight. With that in mind, he goes Chunda Ramode and tells Duan he's still the rep, He'll just take that position next time, so he better not die. Oh, he does care. Finally alone, Duan opens the system to receive his rewards. Since he got nothing to do with the boss's defeat, 
his rewards are going to be considerably reduced. He probably won't get much at. Holy guacamole, 12 bronze keys all at once? Shoot, guess I was wrong. Some days later, Duan is seen at Si Yun Lun Mausoleum, the final resting place of his father's ashes. Here, he remembers the events of his dad's death while looking at a picture of them. Due to a malfunction in his car's brake, he was forced to swerve into a pole to avoid a pedestrian. The crash was so severe that it took his life. Right as he's thinking of this, Duan hears a familiar voice speak up from the side. This person tells him his father was a great man. But what if he told him that his death wasn't actually an accident? Rather, what if it was a planned crime? And the culprit is someone he's quite close with. These are the questions asked by Han Unsung as he steps in front of Duan. Confused, Duan asks how Yun Sung even knows, or rather knew, his father. Yun Sung thinks back on a time in his past, back when he was a kid. A man once tried to give him some advice and showed concern for his health. This man claimed to be a bully hunter. I freaking call that so hard, hell yeah. Sorry, lost my cool there. Anywho, young son just tells Duan that isn't important right now. Duan insists that the accident had to be just that. The police told them it was one after all. Young son is quick to shatter that argument though. The man he was with the other night, Jung Suk Yang, has video evidence that proves the accident was a planned one. Whether or not he believes this is for Duan to decide himself. With his piece said, Young Sun leaves. That night, after a full day of stewing over what he's heard, Duan makes his decision. Over in Young Sun's apartment, he receives a message from Duan asking a single question Where can he find Jung Suk Yang? In a back alley somewhere in the city, Jung and his bodyguard are seen walking under an umbrella in the spring rain. As the rain stops, they're surprised to see a young man walking up to them. Ah Duan has arrived to face Jung. He asked about the evidence. To this, Jung simply replies by holding up a USB. Duan demands that he hand it over. Jung has other plans though. He just doesn't want to. If Duan wants the evidence, he'll have to take, whoa. Yes, he's way ahead of you, Jung boy. Duan's already leaping for the USB before he can even finish his sentence. Unfortunately, the bodyguard chooses this moment to step in and punch Duan back. While the bodyguard acts tough and prepares to attack further, Duan stands calmly Time to show where all the 12 bronze keys from the dungeon went. With a blind spot strike to the face, he knocks the thug off balance with a multi-strike destruction. He batters his body and finally, with a stun slam, he bashes his fat head into the ground and knocks him out. All within the span of seconds. With 12 keys of stats, he's raised his MP to 1600 points. Annoyed, Jung tells him he will not be so forgiving of Duan beating his men this time. With a quick jump, he leaps at Duan for a kick and misses. Where did he? Oh, there he is. Up above Jung, Duan drops down with a charged up falcon drop to the arm. Despite his increased mana and ability to spam active skills now, Jung quickly proves that he's just on a different level than Duan. From the falcon drop to the blind spot strike to the stun smash, none of his skills have the intended effect on Jung. It's like he's straight up invincible compared to someone like Duan. Growing tired of the fight, he tells Duan that he'll only use two more hits to finish things. In that time, Duan had better show him something fun. With a single uppercut as his first hit, he drops Duan's health by more than a thousand points, leaving him with just barely over 200 HP out of his 1500. On the floor, Duan uses a blind spot strike to trip Jung on the rainwater under his foot. After bringing him down, Duan gets on top of the man and starts pounding away with not one, not two, but three activations of multi-strike destruction. And just like before, it achieves nothing. Even from point-blank range, Jung simply dodge every single hit. Annoyed and disappointed, Jung tells Duan to just take the USB. Psych fool. Wait, no, that's my guy. Ah, curse you, Jung Suk Yang. Yes, so uh, he was messing with Duan. With a heavy blow, he sends Duan flying into a wall, utterly defeated. That was his second attack, and now this fight is over. Much later, Duan wakes up from his beatdown. To a downpour of rain in that same alley. After remembering everything that led to this, he breaks down in tears. He apologizes to his father. He's sorry. More than that, he's scared. He has to go to Jung to get him justice. But he's too weak to fight him. If only he was stronger. With that thought burning in his mind, the system appears before him with a new quest. The rewards are a 10,000 point increase to HP, a 1,000 increase to MP, and a 200 point increase to all his battle stats. With this, his true journey to becoming strong shall begin. After the incident with Jung, Duan is determined to get stronger. No matter what this new quest is, he'll complete it 
and get the power he needs. Okay, that might have been easier said than done. Turns out he has to complete five objectives. Number one, traveling to school in the dragon pose for 50 kilometers. Number two, sitting on an invisible chair for seven days total. Number three, catching a hundred pigeons with his bare hands. Number four, hanging onto the bottom of a slide for five whole days. And number five, clearing the Ning Fit game on hell difficulty. With how hard all that is, and it is hard man, believe me. Duan's only made about 2% progress in a full week. In the playground one evening, he starts thinking of reasons why this might not be worth it anyways. After all, what if the evidence isn't even real? He'd just be wasting time instead of getting justice for his dad then, wouldn't he? Right as he's about to quit, he hears Kang si Hu nearby. His former bully reveals that, because of how fat he was in middle school, he was too embarrassed to ever go to a gym. Instead, he'd come to this playground whenever it was empty, and work out in silence for two whole years. Compared to that kind of dedication, Duan can't help but be disappointed in himself. When justice for his father's life is on the line, can he not even muster that same sort of resolve? Of course he can, and he will. But the fire within him burning bright once more, he commits himself to finishing these quests no matter what. Two months later, Jung Suk Yang is sitting in his office when someone enters the room. From a distance, he seems the same as before. When Jung sees him, he realizes Duan has come for the USB once again. With a smug look, he tells Duan that this will end just like he warned him before. With Duan being beaten to death, surprisingly, Duan shows no reaction. Instead, he simply turns back and closes the doors behind him. Turning to face Jung, a completely new man shows his face with a single statement. This time, things will be different. Holy hell, I can't believe it. He finally glowed up. I have waited almost 30 damn chapters for this, let's go. After a two-month-long training montage to complete the quest given to him by the system, Duan has come to Jung with the goal of reaching the truth behind his dad's death. Despite his new physique though, Jung is certain he still doesn't stand a chance. After all, how much could he have possibly grown in just two months? Right? Oh boy, you are in for a rune awakening. Every attack he throws at Duan is blocked or dodged with visibly minimum effort from the boy. Even when he tries to talk smack, Duan simply looks down on him and ignores all his attempts to damage him. With his heightened defense and agility, he barely even needs to do anything to make Jung's attacks worthless. Jung, on the other hand, remembers a talk with Ham Young's son from months ago. Back then, he told Jung that Duan seems to have an unusual level of potential within him. Is this what he meant? Even so, there's no way he can actually beat Jung, right? After all, Duan hasn't thrown a single punch of his own yet. With this in mind, he leaps forward, while making a pro-gamer move. He starts talking smack about Duan's dad. Yeah, shouldn't have pushed that button. Bam, with a single uppercut and a punch to the body. Duan knocks the air right out of Jung's lungs and drops him to the ground. Yup, there's the rune awakening. Aura, sleepening. I guess, lol. Surprisingly enough, Jung simply starts laughing. After rising from the last attack, he comments that he's thrilled to finally be able to fight a proper battle. As the two go on to trade blows, Jung quickly realizes that despite Duwin's newfound power, his battle experience is the same as before. Using this to his advantage, he tries to catch Duwin by surprise, with their surroundings like tripping him over a sofa. Though Duwin manages to keep up with that at first, Jung slowly starts letting loose more and more of his true power. A punch to the side, a kick to the face, a jab to the body. One after another, he finally manages to land some solid hits on Duwin. As this happens, Duwen realizes that Jung wasn't fighting seriously up until now. Well, good. Neither was he. With a smirk on his face, Duwen catches Jung's next attack and tells him this is over. Uppercut. Jab to the face. Jab to the face. Hook. Uppercut. Uppercut. With a series of might blows, Duwen absolutely rocks Jung's world. Smug as ever, Jung thinks he has the upper hand when he manages to dodge a single hit and goes in for a punch. Duan, however, simply catches this, with his face. Guess he didn't even need to dodge or block to begin with. With Jung standing shocked in place, Duan shoots forward with a single full power punch. With his new attack stat of 231, this would have already done some staggering damage. But on top of that, critical hit activates as well, and Jung ends up getting his back absolutely blown out. After taking the USB from the unconscious bully, Duan walks out of the building without so much as a look back. When Duan walks out of the building, he's surprised at the sight before him. He's actually spoken to Ung Sun more in recent times and developed a sort of friendship with him. 
but this is certainly unexpected. Han Young Sun facing off against dozens of Bong Shindong bullies, preventing them from entering the office. Despite there being over 40 of them, Young Sun's aura alone is terrifying enough to keep them at bay. Even when they see Du Wen walking out of the office and get angered, they allow him to leave with Young Sun instead of fighting them. While I head inside to see what the hell was going on with Jung, Young Sun and Du Wen go take a seat in a park. Here, Du Wen finally watches the video on Jung's USB. In it, he sees exactly why his father's car brakes malfunctioned. The day of his accident, some strange man in a disguise messed with his car's braking mechanism on purpose. On top of that, though the man's face is covered, one thing is clearly visible. The jacket he's wearing, that's the uniform of Sunlight Shelter. The very organization Duwin's father made to help delinquents in the first place. And this is how this person repaid him? Duwin is furious at this revelation, but Ung Sun is quick to calm him down. Sure, they may be wearing that uniform, but they can't be 100% certain that the person actually was a member of Sunlight Shelter. Besides, at the moment, they've got basically no leads on who it might be. Something Ung Sun says manages to give Duwin an idea, though. If this person was indeed a member of Sunlight Shelter, there might be some clue about their identity at the old building where the organization was based. Happy to have a direction, Duwen thanks Ung Sun and heads home for the day. When Ung Sun asks what Duwen plans to do when he finally catches the culprit, he simply says it should be obvious. He's going to crush them. Speaking of crushing people, Duwen finds out at school the next day that midterm exams are coming in just a week's time. And he hasn't studied at all since he was training the past two months. God damn it, he's so screwed. Or maybe not quite. From behind him, Jihan speaks up and offers to help Duwen study for the exams. He'd be more than happy to study together at his home. God bless you, Jihan. Everyone needs a friend like you. When they leave school that day, Duwen finally comes to a realization. Jihan is his friend. Wow. And I thought my PC was slow. The hell, man? Weirdly enough, while they're walking to Jihan's house, a system pop-up suddenly appears to give Duwen a quest. Protect Yuji Han during exam week. So much for exams being his biggest worry. 